Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final uh, seminar of the semester, the spring 2021 semester. Uh, this is part of the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences Stony Brook Southampton lecture series, which we do each academic semester, one per month. And as I said, this is the final installment of uh, spring 2021. And we're very excited to have this evening's presentation, which is a shared presentation of the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, uh, which is put together by multiple faculty members from uh, Stony Brook School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm just going to start by acknowledging there's been dozens and dozens of uh, students, graduate students, undergrads, and volunteers who have participated in this program. Uh, this program really is, as you'll learn momentarily, well over a decade old. Um, and I'll also very um, acknowledge the very hard work of Mike Dole. Uh, Mike is on vacation this week, and uh, we didn't want to interrupt that. He works extremely hard for this program, uh, but I will acknowledge that his very hard work has made, uh, made this program possible. And actually, not just possible, has made it totally thrive. So I'm going to begin tonight by just putting uh, in context where Shinnecock Bay is and has been uh, over recent decades. And it's really where all of Long Island has been in recent decades, um, because as the population of Long Island, particularly Eastern Long Island, has grown, we've seen nitrogen levels in groundwater rise. And we know that's from uh, primarily due to uh, people's on-site septic systems to a lesser extent. Uh, fertilizer. Uh, we also know in parallel there's been incredible shifts and declines in rare, very important fisheries. So this is uh, most emblematic. Uh, the most uh, prime example of this is Great South Bay, which used to supply uh, the biggest, was the biggest source of hard clams for the entire United States uh, in the 1970s. Declines of more than 99 percent with estimates that in the 1970s, the number of clams could filter the bay in three days, uh, and that now today it would take potentially three months. And so with that overloading of nutrients and with the loss of all these shellfish, we've had no shortage of water quality impairments across Long Island, harmful algal blooms of all different types, um, low oxygen conditions, uh, and other sorts of problems. And uh, you know, most emblematic, emblematic of that uh, potentially, you could argue, would be Great South Bay, excuse me, Shinnecock Bay. Uh, because when we began this program um, in 2011, we were faced with a situation where Shinnecock Bay was experiencing intense brown tides every single year. Brown tides we knew to be toxic to shellfish. Um, red tides causing uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning events within Shinnecock Bay, closing the entire Western Basin of Shinnecock Bay. Uh, the clam landings in Shinnecock Bay paralleled those of Great South Bay with a decline of more than 99% uh, since it's from the peak in 1970. Uh, and an incredible loss of uh, eelgrass across Shinnecock Bay. It's estimated that potentially most of Shinnecock Bay at one time was covered with eelgrass. And even this map that Cornell Cooperative Extension had put together in 2006, just five years later, uh, many of these regions did not have seagrass. And so, uh, you know, my collaborator, Brad Peterson, and I, uh, back before we even began this program, we're, we're working together on a conceptual model where estuaries could essentially be in two different, uh, what we'd call stable states. So, you know, one state where you have lots of bivalves that are filtering the water, keeping the water clear, making that clear water, allowing them to, um, the clear water facilitating the growth of seagrass uh, that would produce oxygen that would be beneficial for the clams. Uh, the clams would be uh, fertilizing the sediments at high densities, and so with not too high level of nitrogen, uh, benefiting the seagrass, and we call this a um, positive feedback loop between the clams and the seagrass, clams keeping the water clear for the seagrass, seagrass oxygenating the sediment for the clams. Um, but the condition we had at the start of this program was quite different. Uh, with the clams lost, there was nothing to filter the water and keep it clear. We had ongoing harmful algal blooms. Uh, the low light conditions essentially led to the uh, massive retreat of 
of seagrasses. Uh, and instead of those sediments being kept in the sediment, um, they were fluxing out of the sediment. And plus, we know we had the huge increase in the overall nitrogen loading. And so the context of this and knowing what this was in, Brad Peterson and I in 2004 uh, began in earnest. That was the roots of this actual program, uh, where we actually spent about seven years before this program even began doing experiments and surveys that set up what we started in uh, 2012. Uh, so, but before that, we wanted to figure out what's going on in Shinnecock Bay uh, and how is that water quality changing and varied in space and time across the bay. Uh, and then thinking about bivalves, we wanted to understand and did research understanding which bivalve species would thrive within which regions of Shinnecock Bay. And Brad was also very interested, of course, in eelgrass and knowing what types of eelgrass would uh, thrive in which portions of Shinnecock Bay. And we also looked carefully at water circulation uh, programs. And it was this foundation of science, so seven years of research, that then set up what became the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. Um, and so you'll see what I'm emphasizing here, concurrent location and species-specific restoration activities. And so a lot of times people, I've heard people say, or people ask, you know, well, wh why is the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program different? Um, and so this is what's different, is the fact that uh, unlike some other programs uh, that had to be performed in specific locations, we didn't presuppose anything. Like I said, we did that seven years of research and based on that research decided on the reasons that would be best for restoring clams, uh, the best for oysters, the best for seagrass, uh, and then other areas where we wouldn't, didn't need to restore anything, but we just monitored carefully with regards to how the program would unfold. So I'm gonna to start tonight talking about our efforts on hard clam restoration. Um, and so in this light, when we worked on hard clams, um, one of the biggest things that we did was focus on hard clam spawner sanctuaries. So we were not interested in planting clams so that they would simply filter the water. Rather, the goal of our hard clam spawner sanctuaries was to get enough clams in the water so that they could reproduce and repopulate the bay uh, by planting them very close together. So to be successful with that, one of the first things we had to do was to engage the regional stakeholders uh, because we knew if we just put down a lot of hard clams, uh, potentially they would all be either harvested away. Uh, and of course, it's the Southampton trustees that own the Bay Bottom. Um, and so one of the first things we did was meet with the trustees who I'll just say right now, first I know some of them are in attendance, which is great. And I'll say that for more than a decade, they've been incredible partners for this program. Uh, because I told them, look, we, we'd like to make um, spawner sanctuaries, regions where we can plant clams, um, and the clams can be close together, we can reproduce, but not be harvested. And they said, okay, well, that's, that's great, we agree, uh, but you have to get the Bayman on board. Um, and so that was, uh, for me, a little bit of a nerve-wracking uh, proposition at first, uh, not having had to ask Bayman to give up bottomlands before, but I was very impressed because Upon hearing the science, uh, the Bayman actually became great partners in this program as well. And not only agreed to having these spawner sanctuaries, but have actually helped patrol these spawner sanctuaries. We've had the, uh, the Bayman come out and say, hey, we see people out on the, uh, in your spawner sanctuaries. We think they might be harvesting clams. Uh, thankfully, when that's happened, it's often been people like Brad Peterson or students actually doing the survey. Um, and so these locations were chosen, I will say, for very important reasons. So again, we had seven years of data to work upon. Uh, so we chose regions uh, for the clams in particular that would be the right bottom type, uh, that would not have the intensity of HABs or temperature, harmful algal blooms or temperature that would be unsuitable for the clams. Uh, we wanted to avoid predators and also make sure that the larvae would stay within the bay. Um, and again, and I should just emphasize the whole idea, just going back to here, of planting these clams close together, uh, in case I don't get to say it later, is that, again, the research that Brad had done in his surveys of the bay when we began essentially led to the conclusion where we knew there were clams were not close enough to have successful reproduction in the bay. There were less than one clam per square meter. Uh, these are broadcast spawners, so they spawn larvae, as shown here. 
And uh, those larvae were just, the gametes from the clams were not gonna collide to form those larvae. So we had to have them densely packed uh, in these spawner sanctuaries. Uh, and we also created a hydrodynamic model to understand if we do put the clams out there and the larvae spawn, where will they go? And so again, we chose locations so that the, the hard clam spawner sanctuaries would repopulate the bay, both to the east and potentially to the west. And so here are the hard clam spawner sanctuary locations, again, in Weesuck Creek and Tiana Bay, uh, 64 of them in total with uh, more than 3 million clams planted. Uh, we do that by getting large truckloads delivered uh, from clam dealerships uh, and then essentially just carefully putting them down with using GPS coordinates and knowing precisely where we're putting them out and how many. Uh, and here's how it changed over time. And so what you can see is by 2017, we really had already hit the 3 million mark. So we've been at that level for a while and we were all over um, uh, close to a million even by 2014. So, you know, this, that was the easy work, but the next work was understanding, you know, how are these clams doing and what are we going to do going forward? And so that was uh, what the, the, the real part of the science thereafter is monitoring uh, the entire life cycle of the clams. So both the adults watching them spawn, seeing if they survive and, and, and reproduce, that is seeing if the offspring survive and reproduce, and then seeing if they actually make it to repopulate the bay. Um, so we've had bay-wide surveys that have been conducted annually since 2012. We've also made efforts to track uh, the distribution of larvae. So once they're spawned in one of the spawner sanctuaries, where do the larvae go and how do they spread across the bay? And then in parallel, uh, Mike has made an incredible effort uh, digging through the old landings data for Shinnecock Bay, uh, the landings data provided by New York State DEC, uh, and frankly, Mike has looked at these in a way that I've never seen done before because he's gotten not just the numbers, uh, but he's also gotten size classes. But just cutting to the chase, uh, and what we had is our um, uh, the, the, the hook title for this presentation, uh, hard clam landings have increased 1,000% since we began this program. Uh, that's comparing the 2011 landings to what we have today, where today we're at over 10,000 bushels of clams landed in Shinnecock Bay in 20, uh, 2020. And you can see the trajectory since we began our program. Uh, and what is remarkable as I look at that, and you can see that the, the, these increases I'll mention have been largely in Eastern Shinnecock Bay. Although again, if you look at where we were in the beginning for Western Shinnecock Bay, there's even more landings in that location as well. Putting this in even, even further historical perspective, uh, we're certainly not where we were in 1970, uh, but the point we've gotten to, for me, as someone who's been studying the brown tide for 30 years, the fact that we have now restored clams to the, uh, to the landings at levels that haven't been seen since the onset of the brown tide is truly remarkable. Um, and beyond just, again, the total number of clams landed, Mike has broken down this data and looked at the sizes of clams landing. And what is remarkable in this data is that if you look at the types of clams that are increasing, um, the biggest increase is for little neck clams. So we could have had a title that had the number 1,771% because that's the increase for little neck clams uh, since the beginning of this program. There's also been an increase in larger ones, but not as much. And so what this tells us is that this is not that the, all the clams were there uh, and all of a sudden that people were harvesting them again, but that these are new clams because you know, these clams that are going to be in these smaller size classes are only gonna be a few years old. Um, the size class before the harvest is two years old. So we're looking at clams that are gonna be three to four years old if they're little necks. So these are clams that are being harvested in 2016 through 2019. These little necks were all produced since the beginning of this program. And you can see with time, the relative proportion of the smaller clams has increased from uh, a minority of what's being harvested to a majority. Beyond what's being harvested, uh, another important piece of evidence with regards to uh, the changes in populations is how just the overall size structure of the clams has changed. And so if we look at the beginning of the program, um, particularly we'll just say with the Eastern uh, Shinnecock Bay, we had the majority of the clams being chowder clams, the largest clams. Um, but what we're seeing 
what we've seen since then, and, and no very small clan, but what we've seen since then, these are surveys done by the Peterson Lab, um, is an steady influx of these smaller size classes of clams that had to have been spawned uh, within one to two to three years. Um, and if you look at not the landings, but now the total abundance of hard clams uh, in Shin Eastern Shinnecock Bay, it's up 700%. Uh, a, a small increase in clams in the Western Bay, but really it's dwarfed by what we see uh, in the, in the uh, Eastern part of Shinnecock Bay. And so, you know, that's a great story in of itself, but, you know, as scientists, we don't want to rest on our laurels and say, case closed, we're here to learn uh, if what we're doing is indeed leading to this, uh, because if it is, it's something we want to be able to reproduce. Uh, and we're not going to just accept that the numbers are up and, you know, okay, case closed. So what's the evidence that this has anything to do with the planting of millions of hard clams uh, in Shinnecock Bay? Well, the first piece of evidence, and again, put together by Mike, Mike Dole, is comparing what's happening today in Shinnecock Bay to the rest of the South Shore Estuary Reserve. Uh, and that's what uh, we call these five estuarine systems across uh, Long Island from Southampton all the way out to Brooklyn. Um, and so what you see plotted here is of all of these locations, there's only one system where the landings of clams are increasing. And that's Shinnecock Bay here in the navy blue. Uh, and you can see, or I shouldn't say, the minor increase in, in South Oyster Bay, uh, but nothing like we've seen in uh, Shinnecock Bay and in Mauritius Bay, the next closest bay over, uh, the landings are actually down by 61%. And again, if we put it in a historical perspective, going back to the 70s, uh, this, the script has been flipped. And that is to say in the 1970s, 95% of the clams were coming out of Great South Bay and only 4% were coming out of Shinnecock Bay. And today, uh, for the first time, uh, to our knowledge ever, there are more clams coming out of Shinnecock Bay than there are out of Great South Bay. Despite it being, Shinnecock Bay is one-tenth the size of Great South Bay. Um, and again, if we look at the timing of the increase, again, it matches up with when we'd expect the, sp the spawner sanctuary of hard clams to be reproducing. These clams are gonna take three to four years to reach market size. And you can see sort of a steady increase and then a very sharp increase uh, starting in 2015, um, matching the time with, and you see that also in Little Necks, the big increase in Little Necks starting in 2016. So matching the time course from within which uh, we began restoration. The other thing that's notable here is the fact that the hydrodynamic models predicted due to tidal exchange and the location of the Shinnecock Inlet that places like the, uh, the spawner sanctuaries like Tiana Bay would spread clams to the east. And this is a, uh, again, a hydrodynamic model specifically looking at the larval transport. Um, and, you know, we probably won't get into it too much. We can discuss it maybe towards the end, but uh, we certainly know because of that tidal exchange that the total water quality uh, over time is, is significantly better in Eastern Chinook Bay, uh, allowing the clams to, that do make it over there probably to set and then thrive. Uh, another thing we're looking at is, are the clams we're planting surviving and spawning? And so the one thing we know for sure, they absolutely are spawning. This is something known as the uh, gonadal index or gonadal rank. Uh, Mike Dole actually pioneered this measure uh, essentially just showing how, um, uh, how ripe or how, how the ability of the hard clams to spawn in a given year. It's a sawtooth pattern uh, because every single, the clams generally reproduce in the summer. And so they condition in the off season and then spawn uh, and then condition and then spawn. And so the fact that we're seeing that increase and then decrease suggests indeed they are spawning. Um, so that's, uh, important and beyond just the fact that they're spawning, um, we're looking to see if they survive. And again, these are surveys that the Peterson Lab has been doing since the beginning, and we're seeing very high survival rates of these clams. You can see the densities that we shoot to plant these at are around 20 per square meter, uh, and all of the sanctuaries have remained within that uh, general density, uh, which contrasts with other locations where people 
in the past haven't had the ability to choose where they would plant the clams. Uh, and there's been dense predators like whelk uh, that have fed on the clams and led to rapid clam uh, mortality. We're not seeing that at all. And again, going back to the gonadal ripeness, this is something that Mike had pioneered. And just looking at this very carefully in 2020, we looked very carefully at how this happened. And essentially what we saw is the clams stayed what we'd call in a well-conditioned ripe condition through July. And then in mid-July, a rapid drop in the gonadal index, suggesting that this is exactly when they spawn. And we hadn't had that temporal re resolution like that until this past year, really uh, IDing the per exact spawning period. So next question is, they're spawning, what about the larvae? Um, and so, the, and, and are the larvae from the spawner sanctuaries leading to the recruitment uh, to in the east? And to answer that, we wanted to have a molecular method specifically to identify uh, the hard clams because it's been shown in previous research, you can't use a microscope to differentiate a hard clam larvae from a mussel larvae, from a uh, oyster larvae. Um, and we took advantage of a recent techno technological advance, um, and that is what we call third generation digital PCR, um, which overcomes, uh, it's quantitative, first of all, but overcomes a lot of the potential inhibitions that come along uh, with quantitative PCR. And we did this in uh, great detail in 2020. It's a very large collaborative effect, um, effort uh, within the Gobler lab, uh, led by a postdoctoral scholar Deepak Nanjapa uh, and other research technicians and a field um, campaign to sample all throughout the Bay to see when, uh, precisely where we were seeing hard clam larvae when between June and July, sampling twice a week. And here's the overall pattern. There's a lot to look at here, uh, but in the interest of time, I really wanna hone in on the biggest spawning event. We can all see when that is, uh, the event that occurred here in July. Uh, and what I wanna emphasize is that the spawn starts and the densest level early on in July is in Tiana Bay where we have our spawner sanctuaries. Uh, and if we make maps of this uh, and use some color coding here, we have sort of mild levels just before the 14th of July. And on the 17th of July, this peak here, uh, we also see a little bit of peak to the east in this location uh, in the blue. And by the next day, just a few days later, so the coinciding peaks between Tiana Bay, um, and then it's the next day that we see the levels then moving as the models will predict, moving to the east, uh, to sides both east and west of the Pongquang Bridge. And again, as a reminder, this huge increase in larval densities by an order of magnitude or more uh, in just a few days corresponded precisely with when the adult clams were spawning in Tiana Bay as well. Um, so this is really the best evidence to date frankly, anywhere, because there have not been good surveys for hard clam larvae. Um, of the clams in Tiana Bay spawning, and then the larvae migrating to the east into eastern Shinnecock Bay. So just surveying or summarizing the hard clam efforts, a 1,000% increase in landings, uh, with evidence that the increased recruitment and abundance uh, in eastern uh, Shinnecock Bay is being fueled, is fueling the increase in landings, and both the timing, the location, and the region, regional specificity of the recruitment and landings uh, increase in Shinnecock Bay suggests that the spawner sanctuaries are indeed contributing the larvae that are setting up that, those increases in densities and landings. I'll very briefly also mention the work we're doing with oysters. Um, I think we probably, everyone knows, you, there's the, you know, everyone loves to cite that an oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day. And that's true. Um, and in a perfect world, we would be focused solely on oysters. But the fact of the matter is, when we began this program, there were very few, if any, oysters in Shinnecock Bay. And so while they're desirable for their incredible filtration capacity, um, we knew with hard clams, we had a much better chance of success because there was already a pre-existing population that could the one the uh, clams we may supplement might reproduce with. So with oysters, it was much more of an experimental approach. And on that front, what we wanted to do is solely focus on making what are known as oyster reefs, which we've done. So <clears throat> over time, we've put um, 
we've built the six first New York State DEC permitted uh, oyster reefs in two locations in Western Shinnecock Bay. Uh, one is at the very beginning of the Quag Canal and another group uh, that is in Western Bay, we call these the sedge reefs. And essentially what we're doing is we're putting what is known as spat on shell, collecting shell, cleaning it up, bagging it, putting in large tanks, spawning adult oysters, letting that spawn set on the shell and then outplanting that shell into Shinnecock Bay into a reef where we've got uh, living oysters on top of shell uh, to make up our oyster reefs. So again, we've had six total reefs uh, put in over the last four years. And you can see the time course that we've done from 2017 through last summer. Um, and you can see in total more than 3 million oysters put out via these reefs. Uh, we monitor survivorship and um, five of the six reefs have had actually very good survivorship, uh, about on average 50%. We did have our very first one did not do well. Uh, we planted it in November and then we had a stretch of time, you may remember in December 2017 to January 2018, uh, 14 consecutive days of below freezing temperatures and the oysters did not like that. Um, the other thing to note is that, of course, when I show survivorship and it's only at 50%, uh, that the way the spat on shell works, when they start out very close together like this, in just a few weeks uh, or a few months, I should say, they're very, you know, they start crowding each other out. So it's a little bit of survival of the fittest. Uh, but they grow very, very quickly. And in a single season, oysters are within two inches. And by the next, uh, by a year and a half, they're almost four inches. Uh, so they're growing. We have some that are out there that are seven to eight inches long. Uh, this plot represents the averages. And on a clear day, they look amazing. Uh, this is a close up here. In the interest of time, we won't get to see the video, but it is up on social media if you wanted to see this. Beyond the fact that we've got these, uh, the reefs now thriving with oysters that are filtering the water, they're actually serving as habitat. Uh, so uh, Brad Peterson's lab, again, it's done surveys where they're compared, uh, for example, the densities of grass shrimp or mud crabs on the reef compared to control sites, and you can see much higher densities. Uh, similar outcomes with regards to um, fish and crabs, and that we have both higher uh, densities of the organisms, and then a whole suite of organisms that we don't find in our control regions, including uh, the oyster toadfish. So the oyster toadfish actually do like oyster reefs. And in exciting news, we're even beginning to see recruitment of oysters onto shell on our oyster reefs. So some evidence that the reproduction there is taking hold and we're hopeful that's going to continue going forward. Um, so just the limited uh, information I've shown you, again, we're trying to get everything in here, uh, the oysters can thrive in Shinnecock Bay. Uh, some locations do better than others. The uh, more western Shinnecock Bay site is doing better than the canal site, uh, and that's for sure. And so we've been putting our, uh, not putting in more uh, reefs in the canal, but rather focused on that site uh, to the west. Uh, it's remains, however, a recruitment limited system. Uh, so we need to get more oysters in there for this uh, population to uh, continue to become uh, self-sustaining. But of course, the whole purpose of all these bivalves is to increase the ecosystem filtration. So this is a Great South Bay, which I told you in the 70s could be filtered in three days by the clams and now it takes more than three months. But we've shown experimentally uh, that when you do increase clam densities, you can decrease and control harmful algal blooms. And we've been measuring filtration rates of clams and oysters. Uh, and that's shown here, different types of algae for uh, filtration by clams and oysters. And as predicted, the oysters are filtering faster, but they're all filtering. When we have these kinds of rates, we can model uh, what's happening within the estuary. And what we can say is that we have actually the entire eastern part of the bay is actually under what we call control from either from the, if you take the filtration rate of the clams and the tidal exchange rate from the inlet, this area is under control and should be uh, therefore ameliorating the occurrence of algal blooms. And then similarly, our spawner sanctuaries, we have densities and filtration rates uh, that should be controlling the algal blooms there. And our oysters, you know, there's, there's uh, the 3 million oysters in that limited region in the western part of the estuary also has things under control. You know, there's still an area, though, 
that we still have to make progress on. Um, but it appears that having these regions under control are starting to make a difference. So for example, when we look at the occurrence of brown tide blooms in Shinnecock Bay since we began this program, uh, we have been in a situation where blooms were widespread uh, and occurred for a very long time uh, at densities at over a, a million cells per milliliter in several years. And, uh, and you can see widespread across different locations. Uh, but we've entered a new era. You see 2017, there's some cell densities there, but these only lasted a short period of time, not long enough to actually even make it out to the main part of the estuary. Uh, and no even cells almost whatsoever the last three years. So we've had four years without a brown tide bloom that hasn't occurred since 1981 in Shinnecock Bay. Uh, an even more dangerous hornfly algal bloom in Shinnecock Bay are uh, blooms by an alg alga known as Alexandrium that makes saxitoxin, leads to paralytic shellfish poisoning. And when we began this program, the entire eastern part of the bay was closed, excuse me, western part of the bay was closed to PSP, every, uh, not every spring, but I think it looks like three out of five years. Uh, but since the program began, we then had a situation where it was just the very far western part of the bay. And now the last two years, there's been no PSP closures. And uh, you know, so far, so good for this year. We have had things known as rust tides in Shinnecock Bay as well, but we've not seen a rust tide in the western part of the bay since 2017. And then the final thing uh, I want to present is sort of an independent evaluation of the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. Suffolk County has been monitoring water quality. So anybody can look at their results and see what their results show with regards to water quality. And if you look over the last decade, what you'll see in the data is that the levels of chlorophyll, this is the levels of algae, are progressively decreasing. Uh, the water clarity is progressively increasing. Uh, and in parallel, the low levels of total nitrogen are declining. And frankly, there's not many places you can say that. The Suffolk County Sub Watersheds Report was just issued and showed that there are many locations in the North Shore, East End, South Shore, where the nitrogen levels are actually rising, but the western part of Syndicock Bay is an exception. So with this increased water clarity, we can now transition to um, my collaborator, Dr. Brad Peterson, and he can describe what he's been doing on the eelgrass restoration front. Thanks, Chris. So the overall goal uh, 20 years ago was Chris and I sitting around uh, drinking beer and thinking about how, you know, we knew the problem was nitrogen and we knew that the nitrogen was coming from our septic systems, but that's a, you know, that's a, a billion dollar question um, that Chris is involved with now with the Clean Water Institute. But back then thinking about what could we do immediately was to drive that nitrogen out of the water column. And as what Chris has just shown you was that uh, it's been successful in driving the nitrogen out of the water column. And, and so uh, for what that might mean for seagrass, our desire has always been to improve the seagrass through an ecosystem manipulation by changing, driving the nitrogen out and changing the water clarity. Chris, could you go to the next slide, please? Usually when people think about restoration, they think about taking live adult shoots from one place and putting it somewhere else. And that was never really what our concept or desire was. And, and that's primarily because the plant itself has a great ability to claim space when the situations, when the, the habitat is, is good for it. Chris, could you go to the next slide, please? What I'm showing you right here is a series in Eastern Shinnecock, what I call the landscape lab. And what you're looking at are patches of seagrass. And then you're gonna see a series of these images over a six year period. So this was a image in this area and what you see right now was a really good seed set. And then we go to the next, you know, we jump a year ahead, we jump a year ahead, we jump a year ahead, right? And over the course of this six years, what you see, next slides, Chris, is that an area that had less than 8% coverage has now gone to more than 43% coverage. And so if we can manipulate the system so that the light levels are appropriate for the grass, it has a great potential to then expand. So what did we do? Next slide, Chris. We know that in the Western Shinnecock, it's light limitation. And what Chris has just shown you is that over the course of the last decade, 
the, the uh, nitrogen has gone down, the harmful algal blooms have gone down, the chlorophyll has gone down, and the secchi depths have increased. But uh, what's happened with the grass? Next slide, please. So what we did, and starting this started late, we started this in 2017, what we wanted to do was come up with a way to look at what metrics there are that affect the light. And so it could be the dead particles, what we call total suspended solids, or it could be the chlorophyll, the live particles. But understanding how these different elements in the water are changing gives us an idea of predicting where the light levels are appropriate for grass. Next slide, Chris. And so since 2017, every year at each of these locations, we've been measuring the temperature at the bottom, as well as these different parameters, chlorophyll, total suspended solid, and then the color dissolved organic matter to calibrate our model. Next, next slide, please. And if we look at kind of what we've learned over these years, we see that the light levels change from the month over the course of the growing season. And the one that we're most concerned about is August, because that's when the temperatures are the, the highest. And so the plant now is in a situation where, you know, it needs to get enough carbon to be able to be sustained in these high temperature events. So this is where we're really targeting our, our understanding. Next slide, Chris. Now, this is interesting. In just 2017 to 2019, just using our, our bio-optical model, this is looking at the change, the change in those three years. And what I want to point out is you'll notice that the change on the northern shore, Chris, could you turn the slide, uh, get the slide, please. These are where the spawner sanctuaries are. And as Chris had mentioned, these were the two areas in the bay that are now under biotic control. And they were the two areas that came out in the, op, in the bio-optical model as showing an increase in light in these two areas. And I think that it's very telling that it overlays where our hard clam sanctuaries exist. Next slide. But a picture is worth a thousand words. And these are images from the Pickage Lab when they do their beta remote camera. And so this is the cameras from the same exact location in Western Shinnecock Bay in 2014 and 2019. And you can see just with your eye visually that the clarity of the water is different in these different years. Next slide. So our uh, desire has been to increase the ability of the plant to the reproductive output. And so we've turned to seeds. And what I'm trying to show you here is when we look at the natural reproductive shoots in the east versus the west, the west has a lower number of reproductive shoots. And that, that, the, the numbers change you know, year to year, uh, but the west doesn't have as many shoots, which means they don't have as many seeds. And so what we've been doing is we've been connect, collecting reproductive shoots from those seagrasses over in the eastern bed and bringing those seeds over to the western bed since 2012. Next slide, please. Early on, what we would do is we would collect reproductive shoots in the field, we would then separate out the seeds and we'd count the number of reproductive shoots. We would then put them into bags and we would tie them up to floats. And then we would go and drop those floats over a period, a portion of Western Shinnecock and let the seeds just naturally fall out of those bags. Next slide. We then, you know, here's a, just a, an idea of a, kind of the field of where these uh, seed buoys would be. This was a, a technique that was pioneered by Cornell uh, cooperative extension by Chris Pickerel. Next slide, please. And then we go back a year after and we would look at the grass that had developed in the footprint of where those buoys had kind of moved around. Next slide. And we would kind of, you know, figure out how many shoots and how much seed and how much coverage uh, of grass there were in that area. Next slide. However, we've changed our strategy. And the reason we've changed our strategy is because there are things that want to eat those seeds. So a lot of fiddler crabs and, or um, uh, hermit crabs and uh, little crabs will eat those seeds. And so what we've done now is we collect those reproductive shoots and we let the seeds fall out in the lab. And then we go and we hand broadcast them or we, we put them in, in large burlap bags and put them out um, in the field in the fall when those crab predators now have uh, basically the water temperatures reduce their metabolism and they're not going to consume our seeds that we've worked so hard to collect. Next, next slide. And this is just a picture of kind of broadcasting the seeds out in an area and then going back the following year and, and seeing the seedlings uh, down below. Next slide. Now, what you're looking at is some digital imagery 
that was taken, flown by the Department of State in 2002. And I'm going to show you some in 2004. And I'm showing you this, but I just want you to know that a lot of what's being covered here is are false positives. A lot of this was actually uh, algae and not seagrass. So focus on those area that I call the Tiana beach beds. Which, which really were the seagrass that was present there. So this is 2012, way before when we began the project. Next slide. And this is what it was in 2018. Now, again, you know, this is, gives us an idea of change, but I, I think that um, maybe uh, some images from Google Earth might be more uh, effective for you. So next slide, please. This is an image, and I want you to pay particular attention to the red arrows. So this was in 2013, the, the year after we initiated the project uh, here in Western Shinnecock. And then the next slide, Chris. And now you can see all of that dark that you're looking at there is now eelgrass that has expanded from those you know, uh, six years, from 2013 to 2019. I'm gonna show you a figure next, which kind of has them overlaid on, on one above the other. And so the red lines are kind of around where there was grass in 2013 and, and where the grass existed in 2019. And so by basically kind of subtracting one from the other, we come up with an estimate of how much has changed. And so there's been basically a net change in seagrass acreage of you know, almost a hundred acres. And you know, for many of you sitting on in the seats, you're like, well, that's great, but what does that mean? Well, when we look at the cost of actually having to move shoots, adult shoots from one place to another and, and, and restore a bed that has been uh, lost uh, using the University of Rhode Island estimates for restoration costs at $250,000 an acre, we're looking at, you know, $24 million is what it would have cost to restore that much ground in Western Shinnecock. And next slide, Steve. I think that we've really reached what I'm calling a, a sea change over in Western Shinnecock. Um, when you've looked at large restoration, restoration projects, particularly over in Europe and the Baltic, it's taken them over a decade, oh, two, you know, 20 years before they start to see the kinds of changes in seagrass that we've seen uh, in, in the time that we've had this project. And so I think that the seagrass expansion in Western Shinnecock is a direct uh, result of the water clarity improvement due to the, the water filtration by the hard clams and the oysters. And with that, I'll uh, pass the baton. Okay, Ellen. Okay, um, welcome everyone. So as you know, healthy estuaries depend upon having healthy fish populations. And we've heard an awful lot so far on the, um, about the shellfish and about the eelgrass, but this isn't working. I see that the, this is supposed to be a video that's looping, but it's not looping. Sorry about that, but it's okay. It doesn't have to. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we thought was really important to understand was whether these direct restoration efforts, which were building hard clam sanctuaries, restoring eelgrass, building oyster reefs that would filter the water, when, if ever, would those direct restoration impacts have an impact on the upper trophic levels, the fish and invertebrate populations? When I first got to Stony Brook and started thinking about this project, um, you know, it, tur it turned out that at that time there was a lot of information that had been collected by my colleagues, as you've heard, that documented the problems. But at the time, there was not yet any kind of restoration going on. And I put a lot of my effort into initiating the restoration program. And in terms of the fish and invertebrate populations, it was kind of an ideal situation because since there had not been any restoration, we could first focus on developing a baseline of what the fish population looked like before restoration began. And then how did the fish population change over time? Next slide, please. So what we have done to monitor the fish populations has primarily been to use a trawl survey. 
And in the top middle illustration, you'll see what a fish trawl looks like. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, so there's a net, looks like a big sock, and it is deployed off of the vessel and it's towed along the bottom. And as it's towed, fish in its path are caught and then the net is brought up onto the boat. And when it's brought on the boat, we first sort the fish by species, then we count the fish and we measure them so that we have a very good idea of the, the community of fishes in the bay. Next slide. This, this diagram gives you a picture of where we've been sampling and um, you don't have to worry too much about the details, but the different colors represent different years. We have, we have tried and been pretty successful in having a standardized consistent sampling regime through the years that covers both the Eastern Bay and the Western Bay and when possible, also the far west, Quantuck Bay. The only exception to our consistent sampling has been in Tiana Bay, Inner Tiana Bay. When we started the project, as I said, there were no um, hard claim sanctuaries, there were no restoration efforts, and we had actually chosen that as one of our trawl sites. When the hard claim sanctuary was established there, we realized we better not be trawling there. It does not make sense to be trawling up the clams that we put in the bay to try to restore the bay. So we had to shift that station. Next slide. So these are the 15 species of fish that we've seen in each of the 10 years that we've been sampling the bay. And they range quite a bit in terms of their position in the trophic web. Um, in terms of their size, in terms of how, you know, what, what functions they perform. So they range from the small, small bodied and short lived forage fish, such as Atlantic silver sides and bay anchovies. And we call these forage fish because so many of the larger species depend upon them as food and forage upon them. And then we see much larger fish. There's a, there's a big range here um, in the bay. The summer flounder is you know, one of the famous fisheries that we have here. It's both recreationally and commercially important. And we also see bluefish. So those, those are some of the bigger fish that we see in the bay. Now, even though we find only 15 species every single year, we have caught in our trawls nearly 90 species over the 10 year period. Most of the species that we see only occur rarely. And these 15 are the ones that we call the regulars or the usual suspects. Next slide, please. Um, it's clear from this picture, this shows the abundance or the catch per unit effort. It's an index of fish abundance and it shows it over the months of the year. And what this is showing is that the peak months for, of our catches and the peak abundance in the bay is in the summer months, July, August, and September. Not only is this the peak um, time period for abundance, but also species diversity. And, and you might ask, well, where are the fish the rest of the year? And a lot of the reason why we see this pattern is because many of the species are just seasonal visitors, not unlike some of the people who come out here and spend their summers uh, in, in the Hamptons. They, so for example, summer flounder is a, a good example of this. The summer flounder will come in, the big adults will come in in the summertime to feed and they'll go, go out at the end of the summer and they actually breed during the winter time. Next slide, please. So one, one measure that we have of trying to look at how, how has the fish population changed over time is a simple, put all the data together, all the species together from all parts of the bay and look at an annual abundance index or catch per unit effort. And as you can see, 
there's been a pattern, things go up, things go down, things go up, things go down. One pretty remarkable thing though, is that in the most recent year, 2020, the catches that we've seen, the catch per unit effort is more than, it's about twice as high as it's been in any other year in the series. So it was really a banner year. And this is one positive indicator that in fact, we are seeing restoration reaching all the way up to the upper trophic levels to the fish. However, we've found out that we can do, we can use more powerful statistics and really learn more about the fish restoration. Next slide, please. So here is, um, you know, basically it's, it's meant to, to be a schematic to show what it is that we're trying to achieve. So we know that we've heard already that the Western Bay had um, poorer water quality than the Eastern Bay. It also had a more degraded fish population. And we put most of our restoration efforts, our direct restoration efforts, namely the clam sanctuaries, the oyster reefs, the eelgrass work, those are all directed in the Western Bay to try to improve the water quality and the habitat in that bay. So what we would hope to see, and you can click now, is that over time, the Western Bay and the Eastern Bay fish communities would start to look more similar. And this is the approach that we've used in recent years to try to more powerfully determine the restoration success in terms of the fish community. Next slide. So this is, this is again a pretty simple graph, but it's looking only at the fish in the Western part of the bay. And what we see is a much more consistent pattern over time of increasing abundance of fish in the bay. And in fact, in the last year, we see that 2020, the abundance of fish in the Western Bay is about three times greater than it was when we started the project back in 2012. Next slide. But really here is, here is the most powerful test that we have, and it's using something called average annual daily anomalies. And to try to make this really simple, um, what we do is that on each day that we sample, we, we basically compare head to head the Western population of fish abundance to the Eastern population abundance. And if you see the bars going underneath the solid line, that means that the Eastern part of the bay is in better condition, has a higher abundance of fish species in the Western part. And if you see the bars going above that line, it means the opposite, that the Western fish population is actually more abundant than the eastern part. And what, by looking at these anomalies, what it's basically allowing us to do is to remove that annual variability that we see in the bay. And you can see a picture here of Sarah, who's, who's worked very hard on this project and leads the field effort, holding a beautiful summer flounder, who also helped with this anomaly graph. So if you click on the slide, Chris, you'll see that in the early years, the Eastern part of the bay dominated in terms of fish abundance. And as time progressed, and particularly in the last couple of years, we now see that the Western population of fish is actually more abundant than the East. So even at these higher trophic levels, which one might expect would take longer to show any evidence of recovery, we are seeing recovery during this 10 year time period and it's highly significant. Next slide, please. I'm gonna spend a very short amount of time on this, but I wanted to fill you all in on some of the most exciting work I think that we've done and are doing in the project. And that has to do with environmental DNA as an alternative sampling method for sampling not just the fish, but pretty much everything that um, is within the waters of Shinnecock Bay. And what, whoops, we lost the slide. What environmental DNA allows us to do, so, you know, as fish swim through the water, they lose scales, they secrete substances, 
and they leave behind traces of their DNA in the water. And what we can do is just take water samples from the bay. And in those water samples, we can determine not only what species have been there, but also we can get an, an index of abundance or a sequence counts of how much of each species is there. So we started this work in 2019 and we developed our methodologies and really refined them and found that we could actually do this. Last year in 2020, we compared eDNA with trawl results and we found that they gave very similar results for those usual suspects, which was really good. But in addition, we found that eDNA was much more sensitive than the trawl data and detected many more species than the trawl data did. So we're seeing a lot of advantages to using eDNA, not just in terms of species detection, but also in terms of the fact that it is a non-destructive sampling method. Taking a water sample doesn't hurt the habitat. It doesn't kill any fish. It doesn't even cause any grief to any fish. And it's um, in many ways, it's, you know, it's, it's, a wave, it's a wave of the future as I see it. This coming year, we plan to expand the eDNA sampling, not just to the trawl areas, but also to the restoration areas. And as I've said before, we can't use trawling in these restoration areas. It would defeat the whole purpose of having a restoration project that you then go trawl over, rip up seagrass, remove clams, and bang into oyster reefs. So we will be able to use the eDNA approach, not just in the, in the fisheries areas, but in all the areas of the bay. So we'll have a single methodology that we can use to compare the abundance of species all throughout the bay. And with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Ellen. So I'm gonna wrap up tonight's talk. Um, I will try to go through these slides pretty quickly. I'd love for the community to, to interact with the scientists a bit and ask some questions. So I'll be speaking with you just briefly about our outreach and partnerships component of the SHARP project. Um, what I think is noteworthy is that not every scientific endeavor or um, university-based project has a uh, outreach component and, and partnerships component. What we thought about when we started this project was, you know, people really love Shinnecock Bay. The qu uh, quality of life is a big issue on Long Island. People love, you know, using and recreating on the bays. Is there a way that we can integrate in uh, communication with the public, getting them to understand the problems better, the water quality problems, the habitat loss, the shellfish loss, and understand also how science can contribute to the solution? So that's really um, what was driving this part of the of the um, of the SHARE project. Next, we have four simple goals. We want to share that there are science-based solutions. I'm sure you all encounter in the news um, a lot of negativity, uh, climate change, pollution, overfishing. Restoration is something that's being talked more about in the scientific community. And this is really a great local example of how we're using science to design a robust strategy for restoration. And we wanna be able to communicate um, that there are science-based solutions and also communicate our approach. Um, I won't talk too much more about the approach, but you, you've uh, heard from the other scientists that we have adapted our methods along the way. And, that's, and we also monitor a lot of our restoration to see how it's going, to see how we can pivot or refine our approaches. We wanna be able to communicate the SHRP approach um, as we um, get the public more involved. We wanted to see if the people wanted to have a hands-on opportunity to get out there on the water and contribute to some of the solutions that we were uh, devising. We were also interesting, interested in partnering with local entities. There are many stakeholders out there that aren't scientists, but who really have a passion for the Bay. Is there a way we can partners, partner with individuals or organizations that could help us um, in our restoration efforts? And finally, but pretty much um, you know, on the biggest scale of our, of our uh, communications, we have involved the students in the local community in hands-on uh, direct, uh, with our direct restoration efforts. Next. So um, before I go into the community efforts, I do wanna emphasize that 
since we are part of Stony Brook and we're academics and uh, faculty members and graduate students, it's important for us to get out there uh, and, and attend and speak and present at regional and national and international uh, meetings, professional meetings. We participate in state and local workshops, which is really important because we can share our expertise with others. And in addition, learn from others in the scientific community. Next. So um, we have gone out to many different organizations and groups to uh, give lectures. We've set up informational booths at events, and we have our annual eelgrass event every June at the Marine Station, where we invite members of the public to get out with us to bag the eelgrass and go into the bay and deploy the units. It's been a great tool for us to be able to interact with the public over several hours, explain to them the importance of habitat and get them really to get their hands wet and see what the restoration is all about. Next. Um, we take many volunteers out um, on our restoration efforts. Um, we take people on clam, clam deployments. We take them on the fisheries trawls. We have them um, help us with the eelgrass. And we also have people help us make shell bags, which are necessary to build our oyster reefs. Next. It's really important for us that we interact with students. We, even if we devise the best scientific plans for restoration now, we need to, restoration needs to be a long-term effort. And we want to inspire the next generation of budding scientists and uh, policymakers to understand why this is so important and what some of the techniques we're using. So we get them out into the field, children from um, elementary school all the way up to high school and college. We've really tried to make an effort at bringing classes out onto the bay. Next slide. And if we can't get those, if we can't get the class uh, classes out on the bay with us, we have gone and visited classrooms. We've incorporated the SHRP approach and design and results into Stony Brook graduate and undergraduate classes. We have given lectures at local colleges, and we also have interacted with science and environmental studies classes at local high schools. Next. Um, in 2019, we tried something different, which was I approached Stony Brook University, which is a, a hub of the master teacher program in New York State. It's a prestigious program where K through 12 teachers apply to be a part of the program, and they are the best of the best. I uh, proposed that we have a four day workshop at Southampton at our campus where we would immerse um, 19 teachers in the SHRP program. They learn for four days all of the elements of the SHRP approach, what the problems are, how we're devising solutions. They were out in the field with us. And really in an exciting development, a lot of the teachers have incorporated what they've learned into their curriculum. And we can see that we're making an impact not just to those teachers, but to their students as well. Next slide. Um, and I'll, I'll just say very briefly, we understand the importance of interacting with policymakers and inspiring them to support solutions. So we've done this with Long Island and state decision makers, but also um, back in 2017, I think it was, we were able to take uh, ambassadors from 13 different countries to Shinnecock Bay to showcase our approach and to really inspire them to work with scientists in their own countries um, so that they could develop uh, restoration-based solutions in their own environments. Next. We have partnerships with lots of different kinds of businesses and organizations. Um, we have, uh, we're a, a certified member of 1% for the planet. So other uh, different businesses that join that effort um, can choose us to be a recipient of funds. We had that um, happen two or three times. We partnered with the Nature Conservancy and Pew Charitable Trust on the SOAR Oyster Program, which I don't have time to talk about now. And we're partnering also with Billion Oyster Project on being one of their members of the New York State Alliance of Shell Collectors. Next. And speaking of shell collecting, in order to build those amazing reefs in Shinnecock Bay, we started a shell collecting program because we knew that we needed the right substrate for those oyster reefs. The best material you can use to build oyster reefs is oyster shell that's been dried out and sanitized and also clam and scallop shell um, if you don't have enough oyster shell. So we really needed to fill that need. We wanted to try to minimize the waste going into the garbage from restaurants and oyster festivals. Um, and we were able to store the shell on our campus, next slide, and then uh, create a system where we would uh, sanitize the shell, bag it, and then actually be able to build these reefs after those shells went in the marine lab um, in, to build the, in the reef building process, which Chris um, went through earlier. Next. So finally, I'll just show, show you where to find us. Uh, we're on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
Um, you could find us at two different websites. They're, they both lead to the same one, stonybrook.edu slash Shinnecock Bay, shinnecockbay.org. We have a mailing list that you can join. You can email me directly. Um, and we're happy to take your feedback or um, entertain any uh, collaborative opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so we're at the end. Just to summarize then, um, as the, the hook title showed you, uh, there has been a more than 1,000% increase in clam landings since the exception of SHERP. Uh, and that those landings are now at the same levels that we had before brown tides even started. Uh, and that this is the largest increase in hard climb landings for any estuary uh, on Long Island, now surpassing Great South Bay, uh, despite it being tenfold larger. Uh, th those landings are mo mostly smaller clams that were spawned since our program began. Um, we now have evidence of adult hard clams spawning in the west, those larvae being released and then transported to the east. Um, we're seeing an overall within not landings, but the actual densities are more than 20 fold increase in hard clam densities. Uh, we've created six oyster reefs that are providing both filtration pressure and habitat. Uh, and we've monitored and measured the levels of filtration uh, to show that, that much of the bay is under control. Uh, we've had four consecutive years without a dense brown tide and three without any brown tide. Uh, we're at the lowest red tide densities uh, ever seen and no PSP the last two years. Uh, we've had an increase of more than 100 acres of seagrass and a significant increase in the catch per unit effort for fish in Western Chinook Bay. So with that, we're done. And I am so thankful for everyone's patience uh, and interest. And we'd love to take questions. And I think the best way to start with that is that maybe uh, we could have people either raise their hand and I could unmute them or they could type it into the chat. And I see Tommy John has raised his hand. Let's see if we can unmute now. Am I good to go? You are. Good evening, Dr. Gobler. Uh, I want to congratulate you and the, and the team at SOMAS and, um, you know, really, really some great work and, and particularly the graduate students and undergraduate students and the volunteers um, of all of the presentations that I've heard you give. This is one of the best um, and some really great news. So my question is this, are you, are you uh, evaluating other areas where these techniques could be used on Eastern Long Island? Is there any particular places Hopefully it's in the town of Southampton. Are there any places where you look at and say, this is going to be, a, this would be a great place to employ these techniques? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, thank you for attending and your kind words. Um, so the one thing I'll mention is that in 2017, the uh, Governor Cuomo took interest in this program and actually um, I had worked with his staff to develop the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Program, which is very largely built off of what we've done here. Uh, and that program happily is even going to boost what we're doing in Shittacock Bay already. Uh, and is also working in four other locations, which are Bellport Bay, Southwestern Bay, Hempstead Bay, and Huntington Harbor. I can say though, that during those discussions, another, the other location or two other locations in the town of Southampton that I had in mind for trying this as well was, um, the, was Eastern Mariches Bay which is really a mirror image of Western Chinook mm -hmm. Bay with regards to its proximity to the Mariches Inlet. Uh, and the other location was Flanders Bay. And, uh, and I still hold out hope uh, that I, well, not even, I, I, yeah, I hold out hope that at some point in the near future, we can start doing similar work there because I think, um, you know, the, the, certainly for Eastern Mariches, being that it's the mirror image, I'm quite hopeful that we'd have similar success there. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, let me, um, maybe I'll go into the chat here. I think there's a couple of maybe questions. Let's see here. Um, I'll take a few here. And the question first is, what effect, if any, did the Hurricane Sandy break have in all this? Well, that was mainly, actually, that was in Great South Bay. Um, but we did learn lessons that were important there. Um, one of the lessons is that physical flushing 
while it helped just in Marich's, and uh, excuse me, in Bellport Bay, it didn't flush all of Great South Bay. Um, and so it, that lesson there is that, you know, the other, rather than just physical flushing, biological flushing, as we were able to produce here, also has its benefits. Um, let's see. Ellen, a question for you. You ready? Sure. From Irene Tully, you develop the ED DNA. Uh, I, I wish I was the originator of eDNA. Um, it's been around, it's, been, it's a technique that was first used in microbiology and then in terrestrial systems. And um, it's only very, very recently been used in the ocean and in aquatic systems. So I didn't develop the, the idea, but we did develop the way to use it, you know, a way that works, a way that's effective within Shinnecock Bay. And every system that you work in requires um, quite a bit of work to make it possible to actually use it in that system. You know, for example, the species, you have to know what the genetic sequence of each species is. What is its, its DNA in order to interpret the results that you get and say, oh, that's a summer flounder. That's, uh, you know, a silver site. So it, it does take quite a bit of of work to get it to work in a system. While, while I have the mic, I also want to say that um, we we really, um, you know, we really have benefited quite a bit from the support that we've gotten from our donors. And I'd like to give them a shout out. Um, there have been there have been lots of individual donors over the years, but our primary donor, um, who without whom we would not be able to have done this magnitude of a project is the Lori Landau Foundation. And Lori Landau and her husband, Bob Mays, um, have been with us every step of the way. And um, without their support, this, this just would not have been possible. So in large measure, this restoration and these results are due to them. And I wanna give them a big thank you. Also- yeah. Um, also, you know, a lot of people are asking, well, what about this place? And what about that place? And what about this other place? And, you know, again, I, that's what made me really think about the funding. Um, there are lots of places where this approach could be applied, but it's, you know, it's not inexpensive to do this kind of study. And the way that we've done it with this scientific basis, again, every step of the way, we didn't just throw clams in a random part of the bay. You know, a lot of work went into deciding where it would make sense to put them. And we followed up and monitored to see how they were doing. So um, I think all of us are very interested in seeing our work used and our approach used in other places, but it's, uh, it does take some planning and some money. Okay, uh, let's see, Brad Peterson, here's a question for you here. Are you ready? Yep. The question is, is there a water temperature above which an area is determined to be ineligible for seeding? Yes, so the, the um, shallow limit of the seagrass bed is set by water temperature and it's really cumulative hours above 25 degrees Celsius. So at that temperature, the plant is no longer able to basically process enough carbon to be able to match its, its metabolic needs. And so that 25 degrees Celsius and it's kind of the cumulative hours that is gonna set the upper limit for the temperature. And, and just while you brought this up, um, one of the soapboxes that I've been getting on recently is, um, you know, if you look at the coral reefs, you would have called anybody uh, a fool to think that we were gonna pull up corals and send them to aquariums around the country to hold them until we could find places where we could reestablish them. And yet that's the very thing that we're doing right now. 
And I think that as we approach the idea of seagrass restoration on Long Island, we're going to have to be much more creative about how we can deal with a climate that's changing faster than the population, the natural population is able to adapt. And so although the, the state is very frustrated with me because I'm always after them about bringing up some functional genotypes from Virginia that they don't like, um, I think that we need to start thinking about how we could probably uh, target some functional genotypes that will exist in our climate as it continues to change. Great point, Brad. Okay, Casey Leonard has a question. And I'm going to unmute her. She's, she can now unmute and ask. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Leonard here with the Shinnecock Nation. Uh, Christine and, and Dr. Gobler and Dr. Uh, Dr. Peterson, I don't think I've had the opportunity to meet you yet, but it is nice to uh, have this opportunity to hear about how the research has evolved in, in the past few years. It's grown so much. And thank you to each of you and your team for the wonderful work and restoration that you've done. I had two questions that I wanted to pose to you. One, uh, and I think Dr. Peterson, you might have mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to know if the work that Cornell Cooperative Extension in conjunction with our partnership at Shinnecock helped to support some of the methodology for the seagrass restoration that you folks undertook and sort of continued in the larger bay. Um, and then the second question, I think it's for Dr. Pickich around um, eDNA and sort of thinking about how that might support greater partnerships uh, across the communities for the bay. Um, I know from a Shinnecock perspective, we've had um, we had community concerns early on with the project around trawling. Um, and so the potential for eDNA to allow for there to be less ecosystem impact is actually uh, really encouraging. And so I'm curious if you've seen that that has opened up more partnerships for your project. Let me answer the first question. So uh, Cornell has done a tremendous job in restoration around Long Island. Chris Pickrell, Steve Schott, and Kim Peterson have uh, worked extensively in restoring grass in, in multiple places. Um, and so I wanna give a shout out to them. I also use Chris's technique early on for the uh, buoy seed uh, method. There's no one real right answer uh, for every place. You need to understand that about 10% of what's, um, you know, kind of the restored is going to survive. And so when you think about that in practical terms, moving 10,000 adult shoots, right, is a huge effort. Um, I can move a million seeds with my lab in a year. And so I can, I can live with that 10% difference um, with my seeds where with the adult shoots, it would make a very little difference over in Western Shinnecock where, where we were doing our restoration. Um, so, you know, it, there's sometimes seeds work, sometimes they don't. If you can get them to work, they, they are much more logistically easier to do than adult shoots. But I do want to, I've learned a lot of lessons from the Cornell Restoration Group. Wonderful, thank you. Ellen, do you want to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't know why. It seems like my sound isn't making my face come up on the screen, but anyway. We see um, you. Yeah, OK. So um, Kelsey, thank you very much for your comments and your questions. Um, yeah, I got really interested in eDNA because, you know, primarily because it's a less destructive sampling method. But the more that I looked into it, there were many other reasons why I got interested in it. And one is that it can sample, with one water sample, you can detect something as small as a single celled organism to something as large as a blue whale, which is the largest organism on the planet. And so it's got tremendous um, capability for really monitoring the entire diversity of life. It also has become much less expensive. It used to be that the kind of DNA sampling and analysis that you had to do was very expensive, but the costs have been coming way, way down so that now it's, it's practical and feasible to use in a study like ours. Um, so that's, that's really good. And when you think about it, you know, it's also a savings of labor. And if you look at the big research ships, um, you have crews of people going out and hauling the net, deploying the net, sorting the fish. 
And with eDNA, you can just take a water sample, bring it into the lab, and it's a lot less costly of human labor as well. I would be really happy to talk with you offline um, about eDNA and what we might do together. You know, obviously I'm very excited about it and the prospects. Thank you so much, I'll be following up. Great. Um, and just a couple other questions in the chat here I'll just mention one, uh, uh, John Klinowski. Uh What would the challenges be in Flanders Reeves Bay and, um, you know, for any site, I, I mentioned how I thought we'd be successful in, in maybe Riches Bay, but I think in any place you need preliminary data. Remember that when we put this program together, uh, it was really based on seven years of research and characterizing the system before we took that first step. So that is, I'd say, uh, an important thing to have. Okay, I think I see. Ed Warner, is that you? Yes, it is. Hey, good to see you, Ed Warner. Tell hey, Chris, how are you doing? Very good. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for um, all that you guys have done, all the effort you put forward, working in our bays, uh, being a bayman, a trustee on both sides, permitting and uh, harvesting and working with our Bayman's Association, closing off uh, large, uh, vast bodies of water for you guys to do your shellfish restoration and seeing some of this work to come to fish. And I think it's a great project right now. Um, one thing that should be noted, the amount of Bayman that are harvesting is much higher than historically have been in the Bay for decades. So you got to put that into the equation. Um, Dr. Pickridge, as far as the uh, fishing goes in, in the bay, um, you got to remember that a lot of the fish, especially the bunker fish, has been uh, very high quantities. And that encourages more fish, predator fish, like bass and bluefish to come in the bay. Um, I, I'm, I'm critiquing the whole, you know, you know your whole uh, synopsis this year. And I, I don't want to be negative. I think a lot of stuff, I know a lot of stuff that you guys have done is positive. Um, Reeves' Bay, uh, there was a question about that. There's a lot of other issues over there with the uh, sewage treatment plant and the, um, you know, the fish die-offs. Um, I'm just here as a, uh, you know, a person with a lot of institutional knowledge to help you guys move forward. And whatever I can do uh, personally as a bayman and a you know, lifelong uh, you know, resident of the town of Southampton, I am willing to help you. And as far as the, the elected position as a trustee, um, I could help you out there also. So again, I wanna thank you guys for all that you do. Well, thank you, Ed. And, and, and frankly, you know, we wouldn't be here were it not for the partnership with the trustees. And you, know, you, you were there when we started and you've been uh, a trustee since 2011, president for, for much of that time. So thank you for your uh, collaboration and cooperation. Uh, it's been a, it's been a, uh, a community effort for sure. And, uh, and so while we're doing that, we can now also hear from another trustee. We have Scott Horowitz joining us. Uh, Scott, good evening. Good evening, how are you? I would just like to also commend you on the fabulous uh, effort and, uh, and, and work you've, uh, you've done. I mean, the results speak for itself. I remember the beginning of this in uh, working and getting uh, the stakeholder buy-in, working with the Bayman and yourself and I think the, uh, it's been greatly successful because of your hard work and the entire team's hard work. And I think we're most successful when everybody has uh, skin in the game and they have some ownership interest in it. And I think having the Bayman on board and having the entire community behind this project has helped propel it. You know, I watch these sanctuaries, they're, they're in primarily my area, that Tiana Sanctuary in the Western Shinnecock. And, and I watch these like a hawk as do a lot of the other residents. And um, I'm just looking forward to continue working with you folks and uh, really doing the great work of restoring and preserving what I believe to be the heart of this community. And that's our waterways. So thank you to you all. And, and as you know, in the past, whatever you need uh, assistance wise, you know uh, how to reach me very quickly. So thanks again to all of you, you've done a fabulous job. And you've done a fabulous job educating our community, which is so important. 
so that people learn to respect our resources. And uh, you guys do a fabulous job. And I want to just say thank you for that as well. Well, thank you so much, Scott. And again, can't say enough about the, the, uh, the great interest and support from the trustees in making this program a you know, collaborative effort and a collaborative success. And I'll, you know, while we're at it, the DEC isn't with us, but you know, the DEC has also, you know, they, they've permitted all this stuff. So it's, uh, they've also been partners in, in helping uh, usher this all along. And um, with that, I think we've exhausted our questions and, uh, and uh, exhausted the, uh, uh, the audience perhaps uh, it's an hour and a half in. So I really do thank everyone for attending um, and thank you for your support of Stony Brook University in Southampton and the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, it's been a pleasure to offer these seminars. Uh, before we be began this evening, I speculated as to, well, maybe we'll start doing these in person next year. And I think if we do, we'll also look to have an online option as well. I know that's convenient for people to tune in from home, but it'll sure be nice to see some people in person as well. So uh, with that, I, I wish you all a wonderful summer. I hope to see you out on the water or in the water. And, um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you for your kind attention and attending. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the water. Uh, thank you and good night.